Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Julian Johansson. I'm Director of Research and Training here at Nonprofit Vote. If you're not familiar with us, Nonprofit Vote was founded in 2005 to partner with America's nonprofits to help the people they serve participate and vote. We are a leading source of training, materials, and other resources for nonprofits doing nonpartisan voter engagement work. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, Karthik Ramakrishnan. Karthik is Associate Dean at uh, UC Riverside School of Public Policy and a Professor of Public Policy and Political Science. He's also a board member of the California Endowment Chair of the California Commission on APIA Affairs an adjunct fellow at the Public Policy Institute of California. He received his PhD in politics from Princeton and has held fellowships at the Russell Sage Foundation and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Karthik, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for yeah. Thank you for having me. Um, and um, Pleasure to join you all here. I look forward to the conversation. Now, let me see if I can connect my slides. All right. Okay. I'm seeing not, not the presenter view yet, but I'm seeing your, your PowerPoint. Great. So hopefully that works. Are you able to see it okay there now? Perfect. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is a, it's a real pleasure to be here and to join you all. And um, there's a lot of uh, information that I'm going to go through, and there's a lot more that I probably won't have time to present, but happy to uh, talk about in the Q&A session. Um, as the title here suggests, uh, this is our time. It's time for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders to get woke, as it were, uh, which means that we need to um, get educated, get organized, and and, and participate in ways that uh, we haven't participated before. Uh, I think there's a good part of the story in which we are in a good upward trajectory in terms of our civic engagement. Uh, but as I'll show here, uh, there's a lot of room for improvement, uh, and there's some hopeful signs uh, in ways that we can get involved. First, I just want to say a little bit about uh, what is API data. Uh, many of you may be familiar with our website. We just went through a major site redesign. Uh, what API data is, is a site for demographic data and policy research on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Essentially, we try to present um, information in ways that are accessible to a range of audiences. That includes community organizations like many on the line today. It also includes journalists and policymakers. What you'll see on our site is there's a section here called Deeper Dives, which gets you to various topic areas where we feature reports not only by us but by other organizations. We do a lot of infographic work, which you will see here, um, including work on undocumented immigrants. Uh, we feature that. Uh, we've done a lot of work to try to raise awareness not only in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, but also in the more general community about how the issue of undocumented immigrant immigration affects us um, with about one in seven Asian immigrants as undocumented. Many of you may also be familiar with our quick stats feature, which features data um, usually from the Census Bureau, but also from some other sources. Um, we feature data nationally by state, by congressional district, by county, and by metropolitan area. So please check out all of these resources that we have. Uh, there's many more. Um, we just did a site redesign like I mentioned. We've also just hired Alton Wang as Assistant Director of API Data, and you'll find that when you go to either contact us or about us. So please check it out. Uh, we also have state voter profile data, which you see here. This is in collaboration with API Vote, which we did in 2012 and 2016, and we're going to continue that uh, heading into 2018. The main takeaways from this talk. One is that Asian Americans are increasingly important. So there are several talking points many of which that people on the call may be familiar with, some which others may not be as familiar with. So it's pretty easy to make a case that people need to pay attention to Asian Americans. But that case becomes difficult to make when we see the big gap 
between what our numbers look like and, and what are uh, in terms of the resident population and what we look like in terms of the voting or engaged population. And the solution is integrated voter engagement. This is something that we hear often, um, and, uh, it's, uh, but it's something that we still need to unpack. Integrated voter engagement is not just about setting up systems. It essentially is about trying to think about this as organizing um, year-round um, between elections uh, and organizing in a way to make sure that our interests are being heard. It also means coalition building. So first, in terms of the growing importance of Asian Americans. Many of you are familiar with numbers like these. Uh, in between the 2000 and 2010 census, the Asian population grew faster than any other group. This, by the way, is the Asian alone population. The growth rate is even higher if you look at Asian alone or in combination with other races. Similarly, since 2010, Asians continue to be the fastest growing Racial group, Pacific Islanders, less so. Asian Americans have also been important to the immigration story. We've seen sharp changes in migration flows. Uh, Asians were the first among legal permanent residents, more so than, than uh, Latin Americans, starting in 2004. Asia also became the first region in terms of foreign-born inflows. This is the inflow of uh, immigrants coming into the United States, um, legal or unauthorized. Um, and then you see a rapid growth in the Asian unauthorized population since 2000. Finally, Asian Americans have also been dominant in the H-1B visa category, which has gotten a lot of attention recently in terms of proposed policy changes, but also in terms of various travel bans that have been implemented. This has affected not only Silicon Valley, but also universities and the health sector. Asian Americans are also a growing share of the existing foreign-born population. What I've talked about before where we're number one in terms of immigrants coming into the United States, um, there have been a lot more Latinos coming in in prior years uh, since 1965. So Latinos still account for the largest share of the foreign-born population in the United States. Not quite a majority. It's short of a majority. But what the Pew Research Center predicts is that starting around 2050, there will be more Asian immigrants living in the United States than Latino immigrants living in the United States. We're also an important part of the immigrant vote. So if you look in 2016, and you look at registered voters who are foreign born, nationally there were about as many Asians who fit that category as Latinos who fit that category. And in California, the proportion is even greater for Asians as compared to Latinos. So what this means is that if anyone, especially journalists but also elected officials, if they talk about the immigrant vote, they cannot talk about it without talking about Asian Americans. So whenever you see a reporter or a public official talk about the immigrant vote and, and only talk about Latinos, um, it, is a, it is a very misleading picture. Um, Asian Americans deserve to be talked about as much as Latinos when it comes to the immigrant vote. Asian Americans are also growing in importance in terms of their purchasing power. So by 2020, we're expected to hit over one trillion dollars in terms of our uh, in terms of our purchasing power. In terms of our wealth generation, uh, the same Louis Fed predicts that Asian Americans are expected to reach parity with non-Hispanic whites sometime in the next 20 years. Finally, in terms of business formation, we see tremendous growth in the business formation of Asian Americans. So these are the numbers of total businesses owned by Asian Americans. And then below you find the, the number of businesses with over $1 million in receipts. So what's the problem? I've just presented a whole set of data which show that Asian Americans are growing in numbers growing as, an, as their importance in the immigrant population, growing in terms of their socioeconomic outcomes and wealth generation and business formation. Well, one big problem is the model minority myth. What I've showed so far are aggregate numbers, and often those aggregate numbers mask important differences within our community. So when people look at those numbers, and you, many of you may have seen these numbers or reports coming from places like Pew, or places like Nielsen, 
they assume that our community doesn't need help or support. This is why data disaggregation is vital. Without data, we cannot make our case. Now, you might ask, what I'm, why am I talking about data disaggregation in the context of civic engagement? And I'll get to that in a second. So first of all, when we look at educational attainment, we see big differences between groups like Asian Indians and Taiwanese, and even some groups like Mongolians, which may surprise a lot of people. Um, very high levels of bachelor's uh, degree attainment. On the other hand, you have refugee populations, primarily from Southeast Asia, but also some from South Asia now, um, that have very low levels of educational attainment. So by lumping all Asians together when it comes to educational data, um, we do disservice to the needs of populations that require a lot of assistance. This is also true for Pacific Islanders. What you'll notice, first of all, is the scale is very different. Right? So in the Asian American data, um, you, the, the, the proportion having bachelor's degrees on average are are about 50% or higher. For Pacific Islanders, it's below 20%. And there's variation even, even with those low numbers, with Native Hawaiians and Melanesians have, having higher rates of bachelor's degree attainment when compared to Tongans and Samoans in the United States. We also see it in terms of limited English proficiency, and this makes a huge difference when it comes to ballot access groups like Chinese, Koreans, Vietnamese, but also Bhutanese, Burmese, and Thai have a hot, much higher level of language need than, than groups like Asian Indians, Pakistanis, Sri Lankans, and Filipinos, who have relatively high levels of English proficiency. We also see this in terms of access to health insurance. Even though there were tremendous gains made under the Affordable Care Act, we see big differences across detailed origin groups in terms of their access to health insurance. So there are many reasons why we see that data disaggregation matters. The reason why I bring this up is that lately, there have been a vocal minority of Asian Americans, and in particular, Chinese immigrant populations in, in a few cities across the United States that are pushing back against data disaggregation. Now, based on a particular kind of mobilization in these communities, um, someone has peddled the idea that data disaggregation when it comes to state data means ethnic quotas for people getting into Harvard and other elite universities. Um, this is not something that I'm making up. This is very dominant uh, in uh, Chinese immigrant circles and especially in forums like WeChat. WeChat is a forum that is a very addictive platform. Um, on average, people spend at least two hours a day on WeChat, and about a third of Chinese immigrants, um, we estimate, spend four hours or more on the platform. WeChat is a kind of platform where it's not only peer-to-peer -peer communication, but there are aspects of WeChat that are public groups that are like Reddit. And so in these public forums, uh, there have been there have been uh, communities that have been very well organized that are against affirmative action, against now data disaggregation, against sanctuary city policies, and have essentially dominated the discourse. I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A in terms of what can be done. But what it means for data disaggregation is that things that our community has fought for for three decades or longer is now under threat because you have a pretty vocal minority that is engaging in protest activity, lobbying elected officials, and essentially threatening the kind of gains that the API community have made over decades. What I will also submit is that there are some innovations that, that these Asian Americans are doing that the rest of the community not only can learn from, but I would submit that we have to learn from. When we have a select portion of our community that is speaking on behalf of the entire community, um, it, is, it is unrepresentative of what API stands for. So this is not just a call that you know, we need to pay attention. It is our civic duty to get involved. If we don't get involved, if we don't speak up, others will be speaking up for us. 
So the lessons from the data disaggregation fights that are happening, uh, I've shown you examples from Rhode Island, but we're finding this in Massachusetts, Minnesota, California, Maryland, Virginia, many other places now. Um, this fight is happening. Uh, and there are important lessons that we can learn. One is that we have to continually engage and educate the communities that we serve, the communities that we advocate on behalf of. Just because we've fought for this issue for 30 years or longer does not mean that everyone in our community is going to understand that story. Just because we have policy wins does not mean that the work is done. Civic engagement needs to happen even after a policy win. We have to educate internally. We also have to engage externally. And we have to fight. I'll just be very blunt about that. We have to fight. This is not a spectator sport. Uh, this is a fight that is very real and we have to get engaged and get involved. And this is not something that will wait until 2018. And we can learn from others, including, uh, including those that have already been very vocal on this issue. I'll give one quote from Judge Mike Kwan, um, formerly, I think he's still affiliated with OCA. He's a judge in Utah who I think laid out the stakes very clearly. He said, Truth is the greatest casualty of the current times. Don't like the facts? Just call them fake and ignore them. Don't like the messenger? Call them stupid liars. The simple truth that every community advocate who has ever sought funding for the community knows is that data equals dollars. If you cannot demonstrate through data that a particular group is in need of assistance, they won't get any. So this lays the stakes as clearly as possible. Now many community organizations on the line know this. This is what we do when we advocate when it comes to decision makers and policy makers. What we maybe have not done as much and we need to do today is to start engaging our grassroots. This cannot just be an elite strategy to try to advocate on behalf of the communities that we've been doing for decades. This has to be a grassroots engagement strategy and we cannot take anything for granted. Another problem, um, just to take a step back, with all of those numbers that I showed you in terms of our growing numbers and our, and our growing economic success, is that if we have economic development without civic development, um, we have low engagement and that has some terrible consequences. One is that our economic contributions are not being recognized. Two, we will be treated as perpetual foreigners, and three, our leadership and talent hit a bamboo ceiling when it comes to the private sector. One, when it comes to economic contributions. From, from the 19th century, we've seen that Asian Americans have been very important in terms of making economic contributions. This is a photo of, the transcontinental, of, of Chinese immigrant workers working on the transcontinental railroad. The United States had signed a treaty with China in 1869 and the Transcontinental Railroad would not have been built without the Burlingame Treaty, which helped bring over thousands of Chinese immigrants to work on the Transcontinental Railroad. So you would think that given the importance of Chinese immigrants, that the United States would recognize their importance. But it did not. If you look at the official portrait of the Golden Spike that unites the western and eastern halves of the Transcontinental Railroad, there is not a single Chinese immigrant in sight. Now beyond just our, our contributions not being recognized, economic advancement of Asian Americans without civic engagement and, and, and basic civic rights actually meant a lot of resentment against Asian immigrants and the passage of various anti-immigrant laws. In fact, if you look at the development of U.S. immigration law at the national level, it was built on Asian exclusion, starting with Chinese immigrants and then expanding to include other Asian countries. And we see that beyond just laws. We see that even in terms of vigilantism. We saw that in the 19th century with anti-Chinese riots, not only in California, but also in places like Denver. We saw that 35 years ago with the brutal murder of Vincent Chin. And we saw that earlier this year with the brutal murder of Srinivas Kuchibodlo. Economic anxiety plus scapegoating means anti-Asian violence. And if we're not civically engaged, our voices are not being heard, 
and it is difficult for us to be part of the civic space. And you don't have to just take my word for it. These are the words of Steve Bannon. Um, this was uh, over a year and a half ago, before he was in the White House. This is when he was the editor of Breitbart. And this is what he said on Breitbart Radio in an interview with then-candidate Trump. Candidate Trump was saying that maybe there are certain kinds of immigrants that should be allowed to stay in the United States if they represent a lot of talent. And what Steve Bannon said was when two-thirds or three-quarters of the CEOs in Silicon Valley are from South Asia or from Asia, first of all, I should note parenthetically that that is a false claim. Um, Asian Americans are nowhere near close to a, a majority. In fact, they're a small minority Silicon Valley CEOs. And I had an op-ed today with Jennifer Lee in the LA Times, which I would encourage you to read, which talks about the problem of leadership development in Silicon Valley and offend has done a lot of work on this. So, I mean, this is a false claim, but part of what Steve Bannon also says should send a chill in, in all of our spines, which is that a country is more than an economy. We're a civic society. Now, Bannon and other nationalists have a very particular notion of what they mean by civic society, but this shows you how certain elements of our society see the Asian community as economic actors, but not as civic actors, and certainly not as political actors. So here's another reason why we should really be thinking about getting civically engaged, because there are big elements of our society that see us only as economic actors and breeding the kind of economic and racial resentment that we've seen throughout our history. And it manifests itself in hate crimes. These are examples of hate crimes uh, just in early 2017, and by the way, hate crimes uh, today disproportionately affect South Asians. They certainly affect other Asian American groups, uh, and it's important for all Asian American groups to stand together. Just as we stood together when it came to Vincent Chen 35 years ago, we have to be standing together today when there are a different set of Asian immigrants that are under attack. But it's not just our immigrants that are literally and physically under attack. We have important aspects of, of immigration policy that affect Asian immigrants that are now under attack. Just a couple of weeks ago, we heard intimations that any kind of bargain on immigration policy will have to include severe cutbacks to legal immigration, including family visa sponsorships. This is, a, this is based on a blog post that we released on API Data um, last week which shows that many Asian immigrant communities, including Indian Americans, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Filipinos, Pakistanis, Bangladeshis, and Vietnamese, these are all populations where a majority of immigrants coming into the United States are coming in through the family visa provision. This is a real eye-opener for a lot of people when they saw this, because many people in our communities are under the mistaken impression, especially in Chinese and Indian communities, that the majority of people coming here are coming here on employment visas. The reality is not the case. The reality is that family visas are an integral part of our communities. And yet, when these were announced, there was very little visible pushback among API organizations. Now, of course, people issued their press releases denouncing these, these proposed policies. But we didn't have people on the streets. We didn't have people jamming phone lines. We did not have people showing up at public hearings and contacting their elected officials. And I'll show you some data which lend credence to, to this claim. <laughs> so low participation means less influence and less respect. And it's not just recent that our communities have not had influence. So this is President Obama speaking at the APEX Gala in 2016, um, and this was a nonpartisan event. And what President Obama said, it was a celebratory, a celebratory moment for our community. And what he said is that the API community is the fastest growing minority in America. But it's still, so you know, a lot of people cheered when he said that. And he held the applause and he said, well, that's good to cheer about, but it is still significantly underrepresented at the ballot box. In 2012, just 56% of eligible API voters 
people are registered to vote. This is the central claim I'm making in this presentation. People recognize that we're important. They recognize we're fast growing. But it's not a secret. People know that we have some of the lowest rates of voter participation. Elected officials know this. Nonprofit or, or, well, and, and funders know this as well. And unless we can significantly improve this, we will not get respected, no matter who the audience is. So participation is key to building power, to fighting racism, and to be seen as American. I hope that this data so far have, have shown that. And when it comes to participation, we've got a lot of work to do. So this is looking at racial gaps in voting. By the way, we have other data featured on API data, uh, and especially on our blog, which shows that 2016 saw record gains in voting among Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. So we had about close to 1.2 million new voters who are Asian American uh, and Pacific Islander in the 2016 election, and that was close to double the increase that we've seen in prior cycles. That said, we still have big gaps in voting. Asian Americans are less likely to have voted when compared to African Americans and non-Hispanic whites. This is looking at voting among the adult citizen population, right? The CVAP, the citizen voting age population. Registration rates were also low, although there were significant variations across groups. This is based on the current population survey data at the national level. And this shows you, again, why data desegregation is so important. If we just looked at Asian voting rates or Asian voter registration rates, we would not know the significant differences that exist within these communities. And later, if we have time, I can show you some data from the National Asian American Survey that allows for further breakdowns uh, in the data. So how do we get to full participation? This is based on prior analysis that I've done, looking at current population survey data. We know that citizenship matters. Mm -hmm. We know that registration matters. We know that turnout matters. One simulation in which we did in terms of trying to get to parity with the U.S. average shows that about a quarter of the effort depends on getting people naturalized. Another half of the effort, so registration, 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 right? That accounts for about half of what it takes to get to parity. And then turnout among registered voters will get us to the remaining 100%. I'll just stay on the slide for a second so that it sinks in, right? So if people say that I'm only focused on citizenship, that's great. Citizenship, getting people naturalized is, is important. But what that means is either your organization or if your organization does not do voter registration, please collaborate with other organizations that work on registration so that we can get those registration numbers up. And then if you don't focus on turnout on GOTV, find ways to collaborate with organizations that focus on GOTV. But it's not just voting, right? There are a few uh, states and localities where there are important elections coming up in 20, 2017, but there are many places where there aren't elections happening. But this does not mean that participation stops. Anyone who's worked as a staffer in Congress or in various state legislatures knows that who participate in between elections is almost as important or in some ways more important than those who participate just in election years. One is contacting public officials. And what our data show is that Asian Americans have among the lowest rates when it comes to contacting public officials. There is a bright spot when it comes to Pacific Islanders who do seem to have higher rates of contacting public officials. Now on the right-hand side, you'll see significant variation within the Asian American community, with Indians and Japanese Americans significantly more likely to contact elected officials, and groups like Hmong and Cambodians significantly less likely to do so. You also see that in terms of campaign donations. Asian Americans tend to have lower rates of campaign donations than non-Hispanic whites and African Americans. And again, there's significant variation across groups in terms of the rates of donations. Now, I should caution that this is not looking at um, actual campaign contribution data. This is self-reported data in our 2016 National Asian American Survey. 
So we don't know campaign contribution amounts. And there are other studies, including by my graduate student, Sonal Shah, that have looked at campaign contribution records that paint a somewhat different story, especially when it comes to Chinese immigrants, Chinese Americans, and their campaign contribution activity. We also index relatively low when it comes to consumer activism. So this is either boycotting a product or service because of its political value, or encouraging people to buy or, or, or patronize a product or service because of the values that it represents. And again, there's significant variation across groups. And what this shows you is that some communities need a lot more work in terms of getting people activated and involved. Attending public meetings. Here's a bright spot for Pacific Islander communities uh, that are relatively high when it comes to attendance at public meetings. But Asian Americans are at the, are the bottom of the list when it comes to attendance at public meetings. And by the way, for public meetings, we mentioned city council as well as school board meetings. And Asian Americans are more likely uh, than non-Hispanic whites to have children, uh, children uh, at home and so this number should, should concern us all in terms of the low rate of attendance at public meetings. And again, there are significant differences across uh, different Asian American groups in terms of their participation in public meetings. Finally, protest activity. Granted, this was, uh, uh, this was data that was collected uh, in the summer and fall of 2016 before some of the more recent protests that happened uh, on immigration. But what the data show is that Asian Americans are less likely to engage in protest activity than any other group, and Pacific Islanders are near the bottom as well. Vietnamese immigrants, uh, and this is something that we've seen consistently over time, uh, tend to have higher than average rates of protest activity, as do other Southeast Asian groups. Uh, Korean Americans, uh, surprisingly, um, we think of Korean Americans as significantly involved in protest activity, especially when it comes to immigrant rights. But when we survey the general population, we find that Korean American participation in protest activity is quite low. This is particularly important. Now, these were based on the flurry of protests that, that occurred after the initial travel ban in January 2007. But what many of us noticed was that there wasn't as much coverage of Asian Americans participating in those protests. We don't have more recent survey data on how much protest activity happened among Asian Americans, but I would not expect that those protest numbers to be significantly different. Now, I and a few others tried to organize something recently, especially in light of recent uh, immigration uh, policies and actions, to see if Asian Americans can, can try to puncture the narrative of, of, of getting more visible and more engaged on immigration. Groups like NACASEC and CRAC and others have had long-standing leadership on this issue. And we tried to see if we can get community organizations and college campuses involved on immigration action. So we called it AAPI Action. This is this uh, recent Huffington Post story that featured major actions that happened in Seattle, at the University of Maryland, and in Washington, D.C., CRAC um, um, shared the hashtag AAPI action with their, with their, uh, with their uh, a significant protest uh, at the end of their national summit. But I'm not under any illusion that we had huge impact. We had some impact, but there's still a long ways to go in terms of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders being an important part of the public conversation that is happening. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Now, in addition to doing our own work, there's a lot that we can do in terms of improving our coalition work. How do we improve that? One is to get on radar screens, right? to be part of state voices tables or strategic investment in state tables and issue specific tables in different, uh, in different levels of geography and on different issues. But as I also mentioned, we have to also think about voting, but also to go beyond voting in terms of campaign contributions, in terms of attending public hearings, in terms of volunteering and public service. The good news when it comes to, um, when it comes to building coalition is that there are many areas of convergence. 
in terms of our voting behavior, in terms of our opinion on issues like health care, on the social safety net, on taxation, on pathway to citizenship, and even on affirmative action. But on that last point, there is some movement happening within the community because, again, there's been a disproportionate level of activism. People with a particular minority view have mobilized very effectively and we're actually seeing some movement in opinion on that issue, particularly in the Chinese American community. So again, I will reemphasize the importance. We cannot take anything for granted in terms of where our communities stand on issues. There's a difference between public opinion and mobilized public opinion. And we have to do the mobilization. Um, we cannot let others do the mobilization for us, either because our communities largely will remain inert or they will be a very vocal and strong minority that not only ends up speaking for the majority, but starts having influence in terms of what that majority believes. We also need to pay attention to states beyond those we've seen before. Right? We've thought a lot, we know uh, that, that California and New York, especially when it comes to municipal um, elections and races, make a huge difference in terms of whether we're involved or not. But here's a, a projection in terms of the growth of the eligible voter population, right, the citizen voting age population. So states like Nevada loom large, but also states like Washington State, New Jersey, Maryland, Virginia, Oregon, and Minnesota. So when we think about where we need to get engaged and get involved, it's not just the traditional destination states but also states like these where there's significant growth in the eligible voter population. Finally, we also need to focus on our civic responsibility. This is going well beyond voting and other forms of civic engagement. This is also looking at philanthropic activity. Groups like APIP have consistently done studies which show that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders have get, gotten less than 1% of philanthropy dollars even though we're 5% and growing when it comes to the resident population. So certainly there's a lot that philanthropy needs to do. And I do try to do this work at every board meeting that I'm at in terms of reminding my colleagues at the California Endowment that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are an important part of California. And we need to do this work in terms of getting APIs on different boards so that they can make the case. But it cannot just be about what mainstream philanthropy does. We also need to step up in our giving. Some of you may have seen this that I presented elsewhere. Um, the San Francisco Chronicle has an annual drive to try to get APIs, more than, actually to try to get communities more engaged and involved when it comes to charitable giving during the holiday season. And I worked with a partner who analyzed the data of those who contributed. Just to give you a sense of the baseline, Asian Americans in San Francisco and San Mateo counties are 32% of the population. That's a rough baseline on what we might expect the readership of the San Francisco Chronicle to be. They constitute 28% of those with incomes over $100,000. So that could give you a kind of baseline sense of what you might expect the share of Asian American donors to this cause. But what we found was that Asian Americans are only 2.7% of the major donors to this cause and only 1% of total giving to this cause. This just shows you the major work that needs to happen within our community. Now, I'm not saying that we need to blame ourselves, but what I am saying is we need to do a ton of work and in ways that will benefit API-serving nonprofits. Um, we know that there's a lot of untapped potential within our community not just in terms of volunteerism, but also in terms of charitable giving. And this is our time to start making the case and to tell people that it's time to step up. So we need to focus on our civic responsibility. We need to step up in giving. Um, so this is on our survey data, charitable giving rates were lower for Asian Americans when compared to whites. Um, but as I said, outreach by mainstream philanthropy certainly would help. We also need to change the culture and values within our communities. So something as deep as how parents define success as economic advancement needs to change. So it's not just about GPA. It's not just about getting into the right college or even doing well economically. It also means getting engaged civically and having influence politically. 
We have to focus a lot on our youth. And there's a lot that we can learn from groups that are well organized. So ultimately, we need to redefine Asian success. Success is not just economic success, but it means recognition, respect, and influence. And we don't get respect until we participate politically, until we participate civically, and until we get involved in terms of philanthropy. The success of our community, as well as the larger community around us, depends on it. And in doing so, I've shown some historic images in the past in terms of some of the barriers that we've faced, but we can also draw inspiration from the likes of Wan Kim Ark, who was central to establish birthright citizenship in the United States for anyone born in the United States. From Congressman Dalip Singh Sound, who just two years after getting naturalized, ran as a judge in Southern California, and soon after that ended up being the first AAPI elected to Congress. We can draw inspiration from people like Congressman Sound. And it's not just those individuals. If you think of diversity as one of the challenges within the Asian community, but it can also be a source of strength. We have heroes and sheroes in each of our communities, and we can draw upon those examples in terms of getting more civically engaged. And then finally, we need to recognize the power of coalitions. We don't just do this work by ourselves. I love this picture of the march at Selma. And these are Hawaiian leis that were sent by Reverend Takaka. Martin Luther King had met the Reverend before, and the Reverend sent these leis as an act of solidarity. And this is something that is very important for us to recognize, that we may be very big, in certain places in the country, but even in those places, we do not do this work alone. We depend on coalition building for others. And if we need a friend, we need to be a friend. Finally, what this also shows is that democracy is not a spectator sport. We have to roll up our sleeves and we have to get involved. And it's not just thinking ahead to 2018 or 2020. We need to get involved today. And it's not just a, an act of self-preservation, which it is, but it's also uh, important to defend our friends when all of our communities are under threat. I'll end with another quotation from the president in 2016. Ultimately, our job is not just to fight for our own rights, but to fight for the rights of all people everywhere. And that means that we have to be well informed, we have to engage with our government, and we have to vote, not just when it's time to elect a president, every single election. School boards matter. County offices matter, state attorneys' races matter, state legislative races matter. I will end with that, and I'm happy to open the floor for any questions that you want. Great. Thank you so much, Karthik. Uh, we do have some, some questions that have come in. Um, one person, so starting um, from uh, what you most recently talked about, one person was wondering if you have disaggregated data about charitable giving um, within the API community. Um, we do have decided data on charitable giving, so I will, um, you know, when I send up the, the slide deck, I will uh, include that information. Thank you for that suggestion. Great. Uh, another question, are anti-disaggregation efforts coming primarily from one part of the community, or are there multiple um, you know, groups uh, that are opposing um, disaggregation. You had mentioned the, the Chinese American community. Right, right. Well, let me just give a kind of brief history of where this happened. And it is primarily, uh, you know, it's, it's actually what I would say, it's not the, it's not even, we can't even say the Chinese American community. It's a well-organized um, group within the Chinese American community, but that has grown significantly over time. So this, um, so I'll, I'll try to limit this to a minute, and if someone wants me to explain more, I'm happy to do that. So this all started in California three years ago, and it started first with protests against um, the reintroduction of affirmative action in higher education in California. There was a proposed state constitutional amendment um, that had passed the Senate, and it needed a two-thirds vote in the California State Assembly before going to the ballot and decided by the voters in California. What happened was that there was a well-organized attempt to, to prevent 
that vote even from from proceeding in the assembly before it went to the electorate. And we might have thought that this opposition would come from white conservative voters, but no, the opposition came from a very well-organized group of conservative Chinese immigrants that mobilized um, through, um, through online petitions, through change.org, um, and then emerging in WeChat back then. This was three years ago. You might ask, what does this have to do with data disaggregation? That is a very good question. Affirmative action has nothing to do with data disaggregation. But what happened last year when there was an attempt to bring data disaggregation to California, conservatives tried to say that this is just a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. This is an attempt to bring affirmative action back to California when nothing can be further than the truth. Again, I will reiterate, data disaggregation has nothing to do with affirmative action. But they kept trying to make that connection, and I would say ultimately succeeded. They mobilized very heavily in California, and that talking point has now been used in states throughout the country. These are talking points that are shared through WeChat, which is a very effective medium for organizing. We're seeing significant organizing that connects online mobilization with what is happening on the ground. And I would say, it's very, you know, if you take a step back, it's very impressive. Right? Activists are able to use that medium, even if we disagree with what they believe in, to bring dozens and sometimes 50 people chanting, holding up protest signs. And many public officials don't know what to do with this. They are not used to seeing Asian Americans engaged and involved. And what they're seeing is a very intense level of mobilization activity that is very, a very narrow viewpoint within the community. And I've heard it from, from officials in different parts of the country now that say, well, it looks like the Asian community is divided on this issue. Because what they see is a set of nonprofits who are making a certain case, and then grassroots activists completely disconnected from those nonprofits that are showing up, pestering officials, protesting, and challenging them and telling them that they are misguided, and in many ways, calling them as racist against Asian Americans. This is the reality of what we're facing today. There's a big disconnect in terms of how nonprofits, by and large, are engaging in civic engagement, and what the grassroots, I mean, this has now become the face of the grassroots in 2017. Um, for better or worse, that's the reality of the situation. Great, thank you. So uh, another question was, um, what are some of the reasons behind the lack of civic engagement um, in parts of the AAPI community, especially when it comes to um, voter turnout? And then uh, as a follow-up, I, I would add, are there things that can be learned from parts of the community that are voting at higher rates and are participating civically in other ways at higher rates um, that can be applied to um, other parts of the API community that are not? Great, great set of questions. So first of all, language proficiency and language access absolutely matter. Right? So if you look at um, Indian Americans, they tend to participate more and they also have high levels of English proficiency. Although I should note that Filipinos also have high levels of English proficiency and their participation rates are not as high. What is particularly surprising about the high level of participation among, I mean the relatively high level of participation among Indian Americans is that they tend to be the more recently arrived immigrant population in the U.S. compared to other groups. But they also have socioeconomic status and that also ends up making a difference. So the kinds of factors that matter that political science research has shown consistently over time are things like educational attainment, socioeconomic status, those make a difference. Language proficiency makes a difference. Experience with democracy also makes a difference. And this is something just shows the, the huge challenges that we face within our communities. Um, Asian Americans are the only racial group that is predominantly immigrant. Uh, and so when it comes to our voters, many of them come from non-democracies. And so it actually, takes a certain, I mean, first of all, we have to get over the barrier of distrust of government. 
but people don't have experience with a competitive party system and what that means. Relatively low levels of awareness of the U.S. political system and the party system and, and what, where candidates and parties stand on issues. What that means, I think, is that political parties and campaigns and candidates need to do a lot more investment. If you look at the money that sloshes around when it comes to um, campaign work, there, there's a lot of money, and it's not being deployed in API communities. So what we're left with is the nonprofit sector, um, the C3 world, and in that C3 world, we are competing against a lot of other organizations. Um, there are some hopeful signs that there is a greater interest in the API community when it comes to um, when it comes to investments in civic engagement, but we still have a long way to go. The kind of things that matter, increasing ballot language access, absolutely makes a difference. Holding uh, holding uh, election officials, uh, election administrators uh, more accountable when it comes to making sure that they have someone at ballot locations, uh, especially in uh, areas of ethnic concentration is also important. We also find that absentee voting makes a huge difference. So in states that make it really difficult for people to become absentee voters, trying to switch to easier absentee voting or at least trying to use language barrier as a justification for uh, permanent absentee voting would make a huge difference. When people have the time to read a ballot and to get help in terms of translation and, uh, and assistance, it makes a huge difference when it comes to participation. So all of these factors uh, make a difference, but ultimately money needs to also uh, be invested within our community. I guess if the question is, if you had a lot of money, where would you invest in? I would say I would invest in systems change, like trying to, trying to make it easier for people to vote absentee, as well as uh, reducing language barriers, but also uh, voter education uh, efforts. It's we have to address the motivation side of the issue. So if people are not aware of what is going on and, and are, they don't get motivated, and if they don't get motivated, they don't participate. Okay, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, so in states that are all vote by mail, like Oregon and Washington and Colorado, um, are you seeing differences in API participation, uh, or do you have that data? Um, and if so, are you seeing any differences because they're vote by mail states? No, this, okay, this is a good question to, to follow up. And if you don't mind when I say this, uh, I'm not taking notes here, but if you can just, we can reanalyze this data in terms of whether vote by mail states or kind of, uh, you know, either universal vote by mail or making it very easy, uh, if that makes a difference. The key is we need to control for a whole bunch of other factors, which we can do using current population survey data. Um, what we do know is based on surveys that we've done with API Vote and uh, Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AJC, um, that people are less likely to report language barriers if they voted by mail than if they voted in person. Um, so, and from talking to uh, API Vote partners and API Vote in, um, in these states that have universal vote by mail, um, things like uh, ballot parties and and you know, targeted outreach to limited English uh, proficient individuals has made a big difference in terms of assisting people uh, in order to be uh, to help them to vote. I think the larger question of whether switching to more absentee increases turnout—that's um, something that's a more complicated answer. There are a whole bunch of other factors that that could come into play, but certainly we know that when it comes to addressing the language barriers, it's much easier to do it. If, uh, if absentee ballots are in play, because you're not counting on the county or other election administrators to have full language support in any voting place that someone goes to, at the times that they go to, and providing the meaningful kind of language assistance that our voters need. Mm -hmm. 
Great, thank you. And, and then another. So I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is uh, amongst earlier uh, amongst populations that are um, similarly um, economically disadvantaged or have um, relatively less educational attainment, differences in civic participation have a lot to do with familiarity with democracy. Uh, but are, so are there any differences controlling for that familiarity with democracy that you see um, within? Oh, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, all of these factors that we've talked about, so, you know, when we think about, we can think about individual level factors and system level factors, right? So there are individual level factors. Um, so if you, if you control for prior experience of democracy, then there are other things like socioeconomic status, which you cannot change, right? So then you start thinking, what are the things you can change? What you can change is people's level of awareness and also their level of interest and also their experience with democracy here. So this is why, you know, getting, getting people out to protest, getting people to show up at public meetings and hearings, showing up to school board meetings, that is so essential. In fact, probably more essential for our communities than for native-born communities, right, predominantly native-born white or black communities. We, people do not have sufficient, um, sufficient experiences and skills in order to engage effectively and so it's not just about sending people flyers and getting them, making them information activists, if you will, right, or just getting them informed. Um, they, you have to have multiple touches. And these touches need to be happening now. But I cannot emphasize that enough. There are so many important issues from the national level down to the local level that are affecting us. And again, I will remind you, there are, there are small but vocal segments in our community that are absolutely engaged. They're engaged like their lives depend on it. And we need to have that same kind of attitude when it comes to the nonprofit sector. I mean, this is something, I mean, it's great to have this opportunity to talk to nonprofit vote uh, and, 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 and affiliate, and, and I don't know what the arrangement, but you know, people that, that are part of this larger network. And this is something I would say is true not only in the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, but the nonprofit sector has to return to the grassroots. That is part of the larger ethos that is happening within our country right now. There's a lot of grassroots mobilization that is happening, regardless of political persuasion. And the nonprofit sector risks missing out, but also be, risks being crowded out when you have grassroots activists that are very vocal, very smart, very strategic, and have a continuous level of engagement and involvement. They are not waiting around until 2018. They are not waiting around until 2020, I can assure you that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we just hit 3 o'clock, so I, I'd like to ask, Karthik, if you have a few minutes, would you be able to stick around to answer a couple more questions? Sure, I have about five minutes if that works. Yeah, great, great. Um, and for people who have to jump off now, you can, you can catch this part on the on the recording later on. A couple of people were wondering um, if you could say a little bit more about the, the source of the um, NAAP data um, and, uh, and the survey, and also about whether there was um, any disaggregated data available in particular about the South. Mm -hmm. um, so I will, uh, you know, so when I, uh, prepare the slide deck to share. Uh, I will, you know, wherever possible, try to show the data source. So sometimes these data come from current population survey. Sometimes they come from the National Asian American Survey. So that's the national survey. Uh, and I'll include some more data that I didn't have time to present here. Um, that was a national survey that we did in the um, late summer uh, through fall of 2016. Uh, and then we also did a post-election survey. Um, starting in, in November and going through, um, I believe, early March of this year. Most of the data was collected in November and December of 2016. Um, that data allows for disaggregation at the national level, 
um, and in particular states. Um, I will look in and see if we can disaggregate. We could disaggregate the entire South. I mean, we could break it up for the entire South, but um, we couldn't do much below that in terms of particular states using that survey data. Now, I'm hoping, so I'm, one of the things we're hoping to do with the API data moving forward is to work with partners like State Voices and also with Catalyst to, to have some consistency in terms of how the voter files get analyzed um, and presented. Um, those are some early conversations that we've had with a couple of folks. Um, and I think that, that is one way that we can try to crack the nut in terms of getting into geographies that are too small from a survey sampling perspective but certainly large enough from an administrative data uh, perspective. Now, there are some limits when it comes to uh, voter file data. Um, you know, you don't know much beyond um, the age, gender. In some states, you know the race. Um, and, and you certainly don't know, you know how people voted or the issues that they care about. Um, so I think what this will mean is using multiple methods to try to arrive at that question. If anyone is interested in doing a civic engagement report in the South, uh, please reach out. Uh, you can email just Karthik, K-A-R-T-H-I-C-K, at apidata.com. Uh, you can also please CC, if you can, Alton Wang, who was at API Vote and then at KPAC, and now we are thrilled to have him um, at API Data. He's the Assistant Director, and his email is Alton, A-L-T-O-N, at apidata. Dot com. A lot of people think it's .org, but it's actually apidata.com. But just check out our website. Check out all that we have. Um, so when it comes to things like the citizen voting age population, uh, we have sortable tables of that by state, by congressional district, um, and I believe by county as well. But kick the tires out on our site and let us know what we can do, and, and hopefully we can do something collaborative. Great. Okay, last question. Um, one person was wondering whether there's been any work done to develop presentations just like this one, but that are aimed at particular segments of the community, like a presentation just like this one for the Filipino community. You know, so let, uh, that's another one. I'll, I'll ask if you can just send me a note on this. Uh, this is something we sure. could do. Um, and. Um, I will put it in our queue. And this will take a little bit more time because I think if we did that, we would want to do some demographic profiles um, of the community. Some of the data, like the wealth data, are not, it's not possible to disaggregate them just given the way uh, the data are, are available um, from the federal government. But we can do our best to, um, to create community-specific presentations. That's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. Great. Great, thanks. Okay, um, there are a couple other questions, but I will, I'll just have to ask those people um, to shoot us an email. Perfect, thank you so much um, for, for being uh, available today to do this. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with us. Um, so thank you for that. And My pleasure. I, I'd also like to thank, yeah, I'd also like to thank all of the uh, people in the audience today who asked um, wonderful questions. We really appreciate Every time the audience participates and asks questions, um, we always have a much more interesting um, and um, productive uh, webinar. So thanks to everybody out there who, um, who sent in a question today. We really appreciate it. Final thing to say, um, when you quit the webinar today, you will see a little survey um, about the webinar. Please take uh, just two minutes to um, tell us some of your thoughts, what we could have done better, what you liked about what we did, um, and anything you, any feedback you'd like to give Karthik. Um, we, we do these for free, so this is a great way for you guys to, um, uh, to give back. So um, thanks so much uh, to all of you, and I'll see you all on the next webinar. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you.